Good evening. Is my mic not on? Did anybody not hear that? Before we start our class tonight, I have a couple freebies for you, just extra information. So just count this as, a, as extra. I was talking to Roger Sunday, and obviously we do the military prayer service and kind of try to do things military-wise, and Roger uh, pointed out an article in the paper, actually it was in Saturday's paper, I don't know if anyone read it, but in Saturday's paper there's a section that's a military hall of fame for valor, and I didn't know that Ohio has that, but there, we actually have, and Ohio uh, has a uh, hall of fame for valor, and one of the gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Matthew Maxwell, right, Roger? Or Schaefer, he's Schaefer, excuse me. Uh, it was Matthew Schaefer, is Carolyn Dye's great nephew. And uh, it says basically, Army Sergeant First Class Sean A. Clifton was critically wounded while helping to seize the Taliban compound in Afghanistan. Sergeant First Class Matthew R. Schaefer, which is Carolyn's great nephew, delivered the initial medical care and then threw a grenade into the compound, killing six of the enemy combatants. Then Staff Sergeant Matthew S. Maxwell provided covering fire so that Schaefer and the other medics could work on Clifton and three other injured soldiers. And so for their, they were recognized, and they're uh, in the Hall of Fame uh, of Valor for Ohio. And then Roger told me tonight that uh, Mr. Mr. Schaefer, Mark Schaefer, Matthew Schaefer, is actually going to be the... Um, what's it called? He'll be the main person for the 4th of July parade. Grand Marshal, thank you. The Grand Marshal for the 4th of July parade in Columbus. So, so that's kind of neat. You know somebody who's... Then the other thing is I obviously drive around a lot with my job. And I heard, uh, I don't know if you know Ed, who Ed, Ed Henry is, but Ed Henry is a Fox News reporter. Uh, he was with CNN. He's now with Fox, but he's the Washington... Um, broadcaster or reporter, and he just wrote a book called 42 Faith. And um, it's interesting to listen to people who share their faith, who, who aren't afraid to show their faith. And it basically it talks about um, Jackie Robinson. And I'm sure we all know who Jackie Robinson is. He's the first African-American baseball player. Well, uh, there's a gentleman named Branch Rickey, who signed him, and Branch Rickey, kind of interesting fact, Branch Rickey wanted to be a professional baseball player, and his mom uh, was a, a Methodist, very devout Methodist, and he begged her, Mom, I want to be a baseball player, and she said he couldn't do it because they play baseball on Sundays. Now, back in the day, that meant something. So... The next morning he got up and he thought about it. He said, Mom, I really want to be a baseball player. I won't play baseball on Sundays. And so Branch Rickey actually made it to the big leagues. He was a professional baseball player, but he refused to play baseball on Sundays. He didn't stay long because the owners would say, I'm paying you for seven days. You're only playing six. So, but Branch Rickey um, stayed in baseball. He ended up being the president of the um, Dodgers that signed Jackie Robinson. And obviously, uh, when this happened, it was way before um, Martin Luther King, um, it, it, way before, obviously, there was a lot of tension in our nation at that point. But when they signed Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson was raised by a single mother that was also a Methodist. And Jackie Robinson, if you, in, 19, in 2013, the latest movie, 42, was released, and they don't dwell on any of the things that, that happened with Jackie Robinson and, and that he was a Christian and that when Branch Rickey called him into his office before he signed him, he said to him, and he got the Bible out, he said, can you turn the other cheek? He says, can you turn the other cheek? Because he knew what was going to happen, and Jackie Robinson said that he could, and, and basically, as the, at the end of the rest of the story, 
is Jackie Robinson paved the way. There's a lot of things that happened in the, his, uh, uh, with him breaking into baseball and the color of Barry and all those things. But it's just kind of interesting when you hear of people who aren't afraid to show their faith. And Jackie Robinson's wife is still alive. She's 95. And so Ed Henry, in joining this book, went back and actually found letters and different things. And actually, Jackie Robinson, even when he was playing baseball, he would teach Sunday school. And his wife says that every night, with all the things that went on, but still, every night, he would drop to his knees and pray. So it's, as we talk about what we're talking about in our class on Wednesday nights, about evangelism and personal evangelism, in our Christian walk, it's interesting to, to know that there are people who, did, who do live and have lived faithful lives when it would be easier to just basically let, let it slide. So just, just interesting. And, hey, yes? President McKinney No, you, 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 the, the things that, because what Ed, Ed Henry, who is a devout Catholic, but what he, it's interesting because he being the Washington correspondent and deals with all the things that politically correct and, and all the things that happen in our nation and in our world, obviously he's right there at the, you know, he sees it all, but to see just, you know, that was 1947, so what are we, 70 years ago, a couple of generations ago, people still lived that way. They, they weren't afraid to, to basically share their faith and stand for their faith. And um, so, um, just interesting. Any comments or? Okay, yes. Really? Wow, that's, yeah, I mean, look where we are today, that, that um, really? Yeah. Still something, yeah. Yeah. Interesting, imagine trying to do that today in the world that we live in. Um, so, but okay, so moving on. Last week, when we, we started back with our class, uh, I started with Philipp, or Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, where basically we look at where we are as Christians. So when we look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, basically says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk, not solid food. And I talked about how in Hebrews we have different, we, we have verses that point out uh, the audience. And, and one of the things that we looked at was Hebrews chapter 2. And so what I want to spend time tonight, since I don't really have a curriculum and I, I don't really, I just kind of float, if you will. I wanted to spend more time because I, I thought more about in Hebrews 2, uh, verse 1 says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So what I want to look at tonight, what I want to, to focus on, is that basically we'll look at the first four verses. So therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels provided steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so? If we how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. So, the the point of this 
these verses is that these were Christians who had tasted the opportunity of salvation. And so uh, the, the writer of Hebrews, before he gets to chapter 5, there are several things where he points out that as warning of, of this audience and then gets to the point where we need to be uh, having meat, but yet we still need milk because we're, instead of learning, uh, we're not holding steadfast. And so when we talk about slipping away, and, and I want to spend some time focusing on that. And basically, when you think about the, the, what we'll look at when we do this, is basically we'll look at a ship, a boat. And a good analogy, and one that we'll use, is a boat drifting aimlessly away from shore. The pace of the drifting away from Christ may not be perceivable. It may be hardly noticeable until you look up and can no longer see land. Somewhere you have gone beyond his will. Usually it's just a gentle, subtle breeze of worldliness, compromise, carelessness that causes us to drift away. But drift away we do when we neglect so great salvation. This is a true problem every Christian faces, maybe even on a daily basis. It's a problem we cannot ignore. Neither should we give ourselves false assurance by believing once saved, always saved, because that's, uh, that's not a doctrine, uh, a true doctrine. Uh, people who believe it, they're, they're false, and, and uh, so it's not right. So what we want to do is we want to look at why those first words, why that exhortation was given, and what causes people to drift away, and then how to avoid drifting. So that's kind of what we're going to do tonight, and uh, then, then we'll get into some other things if, if the time allows. So why was the exhortation given, the first four verses here in Hebrews 2? Basically, if we look at the, the drifting away using the, the boat, such a boat would be adrift because it moored up correctly. Sometimes ago, this is a, the, the writer, this talks about a Stan and Ollie, uh, a Hardy film, where they rented a boat, and they went to sleep on the boat, and then the boat ended up breaking off, the line broke, and they ended up drifting off, and then there was a, uh, an escaped convict on board. And, but the point is that they went to sleep thinking everything was good, and then when they woke up, and not noticing, but the, sh the boat had already drifted, or sh drifted off. And I think that's what happens with Christianity. We go to sleep thinking we're good, but we just drift away. So Paul warns us, or, or the writer warns us, about neglecting salvation. Uh, and we can look at um, verses four, 4 through 6 tells us that, let's read 4 through 6. Again, God also bears witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own, own, own will. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, and subject to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is a man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? So we always have to keep in mind that, uh, actually, I'm sorry, let's look at Hebrews 6, 4, 4 through 6. That has nothing to do with it. impossible. So Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. So, the, the audience here, in our audience, we are Christians. And uh, when we talk about drifting away, it happens, it's, it's so relevant in our world today that Christianity, that Christians are drifting away. And then in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, tells us, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. So as Christians, we have to hold fast till the end. Is that an easy task? 
Is it easy to, to walk the walk that we walk if we live in the world that we live in today? It's not. I mean, it's truly not. And it, did he tell us it was going to be easy? No. We, we weren't promised uh, a rose garden, whatever that song used to be, but um, there's nothing that said that the, the Christian walk would be easy, but the reward makes it worth it. So we have to determine in our minds that that's the path we want to take and that we, as a Christian, we have that salvation right here at our fingertips. We just have to continue to live the life that Christ has patterned for us. While it's not easy, it's not impossible. It's what we do with our lives that, that come into play. And we'll look at those things. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 say, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifices for sin, but a certain fearful looking out for, of judgment and fire and indignation which shall devour the adversities, adversaries. And I haven't, I've, I've pretty much been faithful most of my adult life, Christian life, but you wonder, those who have, let's say, grown up in the church or been members of the church, how do you think their mindset is at this point in their life? Do you think they think they'll come back someday? Or do you think that they're just... Oh, well. What do you think? What do you think, George? I don't know. God works in a serious way, so maybe someday he'll turn around. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's what we hope and pray for. But you wonder, and I guess as we look at these things, sometimes on Sunday mornings I'll go to, to Kroger's in the morning before church to pick something up. And it's amazing how many people, normal, it's just a normal day for them. There's one couple I see every Sunday. An elderly couple, and they do their shopping. Every, I don't know if they do it every day, but on this particular every Sunday, I see them. They have a cart full, and I just assume that's their ritual. They go Sunday morning before the crowd. They do their weekly shopping, and now they that mean they couldn't go to church after they go home and do their grocery, take their groceries home. But I'm making the assumption in my mind that they've just written church off, and that they've gone on living their life, doing what they do, and the church. God is back here. Because I think that's what happens to us as Christians. This drifting away, the boat, you know, when, when you have the boat anchored and, and you feel confident enough that you can go sleep, that you're, you're locked in, but when something happens and that becomes unanchored and you drift off and then you look up, you wake up hours later and you don't have a clue where you are and there's no landmarks in the ocean, you know, what do you do? <clears throat> and that's what happens to us as Christians when we drift away, because it's not a sudden thing, usually. Usually it's like, um, and we'll look at some things that, that uh, cause people to drift away, and we'll look at those things, but we'll look at those now. Ba basically, this talks about some of the things that cause people to drift away. And... A boat will not drift on still waters. It's the gentle breeze or the current will move the boat away if it's not anchored or moored. So some current conditions for Christians that cause us to drift away. One is a current of time. So you've been a Christian a long time. You've attended church. You read your Bible. You say your prayers. But over a certain amount of time, it just becomes like a machine. It just kind of, we fall into a rut. And, and uh, the joy and the excitement about serving Christ has gone. Now, Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, he says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due seasons we shall reap if we faint not. You know, I can remember as a younger person, I think I was a teenager still, but when I attended Clifton before I went to college or maybe while I was in college, but occasionally we would always have what we called a retreat. And we would go to Fort Hill. It was usually in September, supposed to be warm, but it would be cold. There was no heat in the cabins. But we would go to Fort Hill as a retreat. What does it, do you think of when you talk about a group of Christians going somewhere as a retreat? What are you retreating? 
Pardon me? Retreating from the world. Yeah. That was the, the idea that it was just Christians together. Um, you spend time in worship and at church, but you don't, you don't, so it was a time to get away. Uh, for those who have gone to church camp as counselors or as, as campers, how do you feel when you're finished with that week of camp? What'd you say? Let down that it's over, but how do you feel at the end of it? You're uplifted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you hate to stop. I mean, you enjoy that time so much because for a week or so, you can let your guard down because you're among fellow Christians who have the same ideas and, and, and beliefs and that the motivation, the, the temptations... Doesn't mean they're, they're totally gone, but they're, they're far less than what we normally deal with. And so sometimes when we've been a Christian for a number of years, decades, I won't say centuries, but decades, when we've been Christians that long, sometimes if we don't work on it, it's easy to just fall into a routine. All right, two songs or prayer, song, communion, song, preaching, song, prayer, boom, we're out of here. And when we're out of here, I'm out of here. I want to get there before the Baptist, as we say. <clears throat> so, sometimes it's easy to play church, but we miss what we need to do here. Why do you think it was important for the saints to gather together upon the first day of the week? Why do you think that plan was in put, put in place? Exactly. Every week. Every week, we're renewing our and we're remembering we can't forget the sacrifice that was made for us every week. And I've talked about this before, that, that in the past we've gone to visit some of our senior members who can't attend anymore. We'll sing songs. But what's, what's neat is when they don't have a book, when we sing the right songs, they can close their eyes and they can sing it. Because they've done it for years and years and years. But they know those songs because... Not only is it because of repetition, but those songs mean something to them. And, and that's why we do what we do. So we have to be careful as Christians when we talk about drifting away. And so we take this for granted. That we take for granted what we do Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, Sunday mornings. Anytime we're together, we can't take, that, we can't take it for granted what we do and what we're to get out of it. Because... If we leave saying, man, I didn't get anything out of worship today, what's that, where's the problem there? Yeah, it's your fault. Is that somebody calling you, Shirley, you need to get that? Is that Domino's wanting to know if you got your normal order? <laughs> Can we get that started for you now, Shirley? <laughs> yeah. so, so one thing is, is time the current of time that, that we just let things go. And so time is, is an enemy if it's not used correctly. Um, Revelations 2, 4 through 5 says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will re remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thy repent. In the Christian Chronicle, just uh, some information. This is a 2015 numbers for Churches of Christ. The, the total membership is down 100,000 people since 1990. So since 1990 to 2015, according to information that the Christian Chronicle compiled, there are 1,183,613 Christians attending the Churches of Christ in the 50 states. It's down, as I said, 100,000 from 1990. Congregations have dropped from 13,174 in 1990 to now 12,300. And, but in that same time frame, the population in America has gone up millions. We, we now have uh, over 320 million in 2015. Um, in 2012, while the attendance for churches have gone down, 20% of, of Americans say they have no religious affiliation, 
meaning Christian, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic. However, one in five of those people still pray daily in some form. So while we can look at that as being a bleak picture, but because there are people who still believe in a God and still pray because they have needs, there still is hope for our generation and for the world that we live in because the people still, they believe, they're just not shown the way, if you will. That's how I'll turn that, which ties into our, our series. And then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So what happens a lot of times in our Christian lives is we just settle down. We just kind of do our, put our, our clock in, clock out, do our weekly, and think that's good enough. And we have to really look at, is that good enough? Am I doing what I need to do? Uh, last Friday, I mean, we, we always had to look for opportunities. Last Friday, we were at Cracker Barrel and eating fresh like all good Catholics. <laughs> but two tables down, uh, there was a young couple with a little, like, two-year-old or so, two-year-old or so, and on the back of his jacket said, OVU Lacrosse. Now, OVU is Ohio Valley University. I went to Ohio Valley College. In Ohio Valley College, we only had basketball. We didn't have softball. We didn't have anything. So Denise was Googling and said, oh, I wonder if that's Ohio Valley. So she's Googling and Yeah, Ohio Valley University does have lacrosse. So when the couple starts to leave, I said, hey, I said, uh, Ohio Valley, is that Parkersburg? Yeah, that's Parkersburg. And we start talking. Ends up the, the wife, Josie, played basketball with Daniel Dunnigan. Now, they have a little two-year-old, and so they know the Dunnikins, and so I said, they live in London, well, come visit us at Alki Road, Danielle's dad is an elder. Now, whether they'll come or not, but at least you find a reason to bring up a conversation, and then in that conversation, you would interject if you got an opportunity to the church. And obviously, if they went to Ohio Valley University, they were, Bible was thrown at them no matter what, whether they believe it or not, but, but they had Bible classes that they had to take. They had chapel they had to attend, so uh, they know what's right. And uh, so we have to look for opportunities. Sometimes they're not as blatant as Ohio Valley University, Christian University on their back, but we have to look for those opportunities where we might be able to open up, give an invitation. Okay? Comments, questions? Yep. Yes. And if you didn't hear that, Herschel talked about Jesus in Luke 24. Luke 14, 26 to the end of the chapter, talks about the count the cost to be a Christian. And, but it's worth it at the end. It's worth it. We just have to work for that. Okay? Another current is the current of society. You know, the, the society we live in today is no longer a Christian, as we know it, Christian society. It, it's, it's just not there. Uh, we live in, live in an age of political correctness. Uh, you have to be careful what you say, who you say it to in the workforce. I mean, you, you could lose your job depending on where you work and, and the environment that you're in. Um, you could lose your job if, if you deal with issues that are taboo. And religion in a lot of places today is considered taboo. But that's, that's the society we live in. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So we have to be careful with society that we don't fall into society. And then we can look at Matthew chapter 5, 15 and 16, where it talks about let your light so shine, don't hide it under a bush. So when we think about the society we live in, we're part of that society, but are we going to conform to society, or are we going to stand? And, and that's a decision that you have to make. Yes. 
companions. Yes. Yeah. So basically, it's evil companions who you associate with can corrupt you. I mean, that's, that's basically, as a parent, how often did you tell your kids, stay away from that person <laughs> or people or what have you? I mean, as parents, that's what we, we, we want to be careful of who our kids associate with. But then we don't think about that on our own behalf where we associate with people. And then the, another current is the current of the flesh. And uh, we can basically get into a lot there with, with the works of the flesh. But again, the world that we live in today, the, the lust, the, the fleshly lust and desires, the things that are there that are so relevant today in the, the world we live in, it's hard to turn it away. It's, I mean, it's hard to turn it off. It, everybody's exposed to it, but yet we as Christians, we have to make sure that we're not anywhere close to that. Uh, <clears throat> because the norm is it's accepted. Again, we can look at this, this, the standards of movies. Obviously, when we, years ago, an R-rated movie was a, a bad movie. Today, a PG movie is a bad movie, but they say it's okay. And they even have like PG-13 or different... And the things you see on TV today, I mean, regular TV and what was... We used to have, what was it called, where prime time. There used to be a time where prime time, where they, they, couldn't, they couldn't show certain things on prime time. I don't think there is a prime time anymore. That anything can be shown at any point in time. I'm, 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 I'm talking 4, 6, and 10 for us, just regular network TV. Everything is there. I mean, there is, there's no longer any standards that basically the, the morality of our society has, has gone. And if we sit idly by and soak that in, what's it doing to us? It's warping us. If we let our kids sit and absorb that, what's happening to our kids? That's, they're, they're, you know, they're not getting it at church, what they should get, but they're getting it through other means. And the other means are, it's okay to be pregnant at 16. It's okay to do what all the things that the world says is okay, and, and it's not. When our schools basically talk about um, all the things with sex, and it's not abstinence, it's basically um, dealing with, with how to or whatever. So our society says everything that's, that's sin here, society says it's really not. That was back in those days. This is current time. So we have to be on our guard as Christians, the, the oh, it's, when our son went to college at a Christian at a at a state college in Michigan, when all the parents were there, they basically said they had like five different dorms, and they basically said, "Your child is 18; it's not your child." That if they don't sign this piece of paper that gives us authority to talk to you, we can't even talk to you. It's like, wait a minute, I'm paying the bill. I made sure Brian signed that, but when, I mean, they had basically everything that you could imagine. I mean, as, as a, and we wonder what happens to our kids when they go to that. A smorgasbord of, of sin, basically, is really what it is. And, yes, I mean, we've talked about that before, indoctrination. And that, that's what the world says, it's okay. And, and there's the administration saying, you can't do anything about it. When they're here... This is what we offer. And they had basically five different types of rooms. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a different world we live in. And our colleges are, are, are while well, should be educating, we've kind of lost that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, we can spend all, we can spend 13 classes talking about society, but as Christians, in order to not slip away, again, think of that boat that's anchored to shore, and you're comfortable that you're okay, so you can go take a, you can go sleep and rest and be secure, and then wake up and realize you're, you've drifted off, because that's what happens when we have a constant influx of it's okay, it's okay, it's just a little lie, it's okay to cheat a little bit on your time card, it's okay to do this, it's a, it's a 
when the world says it's okay, it's hard for us to say, no, it's not. JR? No, I mean, it's, it's yes, it's, our, it's, we're the minority, the silent minority is what we've become. And we've hidden it under a bush because it's easier to do that than it is to, just to let it shine. <laughs> but TV, when you were a young child, was good TV, I think. I mean, I wasn't there when you were little, but <laughs> when I was little... TV was good, but we didn't watch it much because we wanted to play. We did stuff outside. We, we didn't spend time indoors. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it's, it's a, the, the, what's available to the world, what's available to our Christian young people today is it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. It truly is. And we as parents and as Christians have to make sure that, that we arm Christians all Christians, because none of us are exempt. Just because you're a certain age doesn't mean that something else cannot, those things can't affect us and, and have an effect. Another current is daily concerns. Who in here has a perfect life? I make all the money I need to make. I'm wealthy beyond my means. I just snap my finger and, I mean, it's not, that doesn't happen, does it? I mean, we, we all live in a world today where there's so many things going on. We get caught up in the daily situation of life and with our jobs. Uh, your jobs can be demanding. They can say, we need you here on Sunday morning. And then you have to make a decision. We need you to go to dinner and take these people to this establishment and buy them alcohol. I mean, it, what happens in our daily lives when we're Christians, we have to make sure we stand for Christ no matter what. You can't. You can't. And, and we, can look at, we can look at situations where, let's just take alcoholism. Let's, let's go downtown High Street, Columbus, and find somebody who basically is at the bottom. And you look at what they do. Do they get there initially just like that? How did that happen? It happened with that first drink. That, that could have been, no, I don't drink. Come on, it's part of the job. You have to at least drink one. It, it, it's, it's easy to get caught up in that. Well, I'll just have one. What does one lead to? Yeah. And two becomes, and <clears throat> so the people who, are, who, are, who have gotten their lives ruined because of what we're just talking about, how do they come back? If they can come back. <clears throat> they can, but who's going to reach them? Because let's face it, when you see that scruffy person walking towards you, what do you think? <laughs> can I cross the street here? What, do I have a dollar in my pocket? What do I, I mean, you're kind of thinking, what, what's, how am I going to handle this? Because we look at, at how to avoid but did Christ avoid? No, Christ didn't avoid. So when we look at that boat drifting away, Christianity, it didn't happen overnight. We'll notice, if we, if we could go back in time, let's just pick a date, 1979, and let's videotape Alkai Road, and we videotape every worship service from then till now, and we see the people who have been here and who are no longer here. But how many of those people missed a Sunday? And then they were back three Sundays. Then they missed two Sundays. And then they were back for a Sunday. And then they missed three Sundays. 
and then they didn't come back. That's probably what we'll see, is that most Christians have drifted away. The anchor has given up, broken off, and now that boat, that ship, our Christian lives, has drifted away. And then we get out in the middle of the ocean, and now we're in the middle of wherever, and all around us is, is, is fun stuff. And then I can go back to church, but this is fun stuff. And they don't care about me there because, you know what, I've missed all those times, and I didn't hear from anybody. Nobody called me. Nobody came to visit. Nobody cares. My Christian family don't care. Makes it easier to drift away, doesn't it? So as Christians, what we have to look at, and why we'll spend some time on this, is because that's our job. Not only to evangelize those who have never seen the church, but for those who are, who are here, that they don't drift away. Because the world says, Satan says, don't worry, you're anchored. You're, don't worry about it. You're anchored. You're good. Until you wake up and, and you're in Skid Row at Broad and High and you're homeless and you're drunk and you're whatever. So, okay, the bells rang.